In the headlines, three more COVID-19 deaths as cases in the double digits continue to rise. The opposition leader criticizes government's response to COVID-19 and has claimed discrimination in the distribution of the relief cash grants. The Civil Defence Commission prepares accommodation for 40th success squatters to be relocated, but no one shows up. An animal welfare group holds a spay and neuter campaign to help reduce the number of stray animals, particularly cats and dogs. And in sports, Fourth Minister donates gear to Agricola Youths, community ground to receive attention on the ground enhancement program. With the news, I'm Neil Marks. We're glad you could join us. The Ministry of Health on Monday recorded three COVID-19 deaths, pushing the number of those who have died from the disease to 114. All three of the deaths reported today were women from Region 4. Two of them were 64 years old and the others 74. It means that for the month of October so far, 32 persons have died. All Guyanese are reminded to observe the protocols of the COVID-19 emergency measures number 9, which are in effect until the end of the month. This order emphasizes the need for correct and consistent use of a face mask when leaving your home, maintaining the six feet physical distance from others and washing your hands regularly to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Now the APNU plus AFC on Monday flagged the government for its handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, claiming that there seems to be no clear plan to tackle the disease, which has now infected over 3,700 persons. During a virtual press conference, opposition leader Joseph Harmon said his party is open to working with the government to reduce the spread of COVID-19. So far, over 3,700 persons have been infected by the coronavirus disease in Guyana, which also claimed the lives of 113 persons. On Monday, opposition leader Joseph Harmon blasted the People's Progressive Party government for failing to contain the spread of the disease while holding large gatherings. The APN UFC coalition remains deeply concerned about the COVID-19 situation in Guyana. And it is worsening daily. It seems to have spiraled out of control and out of the competence of the Minister of Health and his battery of advisors, former ministers and former MPs, a whole party group in the Ministry of Health. They seem to be without a clear plan in controlling the spread of this pandemic. With the airports now open to commercial flights, Harmon said there should be better arrangements for persons to quarantine on arrival. The opposition leader said his party has always been open to working with the government. We have said that we are prepared to go, we are prepared to do it. But you can't force yourself on the people who don't want to have you working with them. So that is the reality. That is the reality. We have said that we advise citizens to ensure that they take all the necessary steps to secure themselves. Harmon also alleged that the COVID-19 relief grant of $25,000 is not given to supporters of the opposition. Asked for evidence, he said a letter will be sent to the government asking that this discriminatory practice be discontinued. He added that the decision to provide one voucher per house prejudices households that are renting a flat within a house. The Ministry of Finance has commenced distributing the $25,000 COVID-19 relief grant to communities in the hinterland regions and Region 6. Bibi Katun, Newsroom. The Civil Defence Commission at the weekend prepared the Grahams Hall Primary School on the east coast of Damarara to be used as a shelter for displaced squatters of success. While no squatter has so far taken up shelter at the school, the CDC installed 48 beds, constructed four bathrooms and prepared the school's kitchen with equipment and food supplies. When the newsroom visited the Grahams Hall Primary School at Commons Lodge, East Coast Demerara on Monday afternoon, there was no squatter there seeking shelter. The Civil Defense Commission, CDC, prepared the school to assist displaced residents in an effort to stem migratory and health issues, especially during the current COVID-19 pandemic. The kitchen at the school was also prepared to assist with meals, while bathrooms and sinks were being constructed. The lands the squatters are currently occupying at Success are owned by the Guyana Sugar Corporation Gaisuku, which has been trying for some time now to relocate the squatters to begin cultivation of the lands. A number of squatters were forced off the lands after Gaisuku began flooding the lands on Wednesday last.
Because of the flood, the squatters were worried that snakes and other dangerous reptiles would come out. A number of squatters had to leave their homes and were camping out alongside the dam, but others are refusing to budge and said they have no plans to leave. The CBC in a statement said Prime Minister Brigadier Retired Mark Phillips met with the squatters on Saturday and offered to provide shelter to those who have been impacted. Director General of the CDC, Lieutenant Colonel Kester Craig, said those affected by the flooding at Success can immediately contact the National Emergency Management System on 226-1114-623-1700 and 600-7500 zero zero and make their way to the Graham Hall Primary School where they will be housed. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patbo. When the newsroom returns, Minister Deodat Indar lays out possible oil and gas projects to give jobs to Wales workers sent home with the closure of the Sugar Estate. You're watching the newsroom. Minister within the Ministry of Public Works, Deodat Indar on Sunday outlined plans for Wales given the fact that the Sugar Estate there cannot be reopened. He spoke of the possibility of warehousing and chemical storage facilities linked to the oil and gas sector that could provide employment. On a visit to communities at Wales, West Bank de Marara, Minister Deodat Indar lamented the closure of the sugar estate there. The cruelty that was done upon me, closing the Wales estate without finding alternative work for every single worker that was laid off was a very cruel thing. I spoke of this when I was in the campaign. It made men feel like they were not men because they can't go home to take care of their family. When the wife look at them, they look at them as a man who is, you know, who, who once was the breadwinner. The government has determined that the Wales estate cannot be reopened. The reason why the government can't reopen back Wales, you all saw the estate would look like that. Everyone of you all live here, you all saw. It is Mangalayan. Plus, add insult to injury. They had people who were stealing the metal and selling it out of scrap iron. So there's nothing to start back if you want to start back an estate. That is why we went to the ones who they, 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 they didn't get to um, butcher up and sell off a scrap iron. Like, you know, um, the one up in Enmore there and then we have um, up in Bobby's. Right? So the Enmore estate and the Bobby's. Those were not, the, the people didn't get to them as they did with Wales here. Minister Indar spoke of the possible sources of employment for the people of Wales and surrounding communities. A couple of things are happening. One is that we have to do a Wales Development Authority, an authority in its own right to see about the development of Wales. Wales will be zoned to do specific, specific kind of investment, specific in regards to infrastructure and oil and gas. Wales is earmarked for that. Because one, we have the land, two, is we have access to the river. So that will be what we the thinking on Wales. So that people can put their warehousing, all of their um, storage of um, um, chemicals and so on, that will be done at this place. That is the thinking of the Canali administration. President Irfan Ali had announced that a Wales Development Authority will be set up, offering special incentives to motivate investors in manufacturing, industrial development, warehousing, connectivity and wharf development. The government was flagged for holding its dream realised housing drive during the COVID-19 pandemic as it entertained hundreds of persons at one location, the National Stadium at Providence. Minister of Housing Colin Kroll and his deputy Susan Rodriguez at a press conference defended the initiative which saw over 2,500 visitors as necessary even during this time. The minister said all COVID-19 guidelines were observed but the government needs to continue serving the citizens and persons have to also begin adapting to the new normal. We've been in government now for just a little over two months and it puzzles me sometimes as a minister sitting um, at the ministry there, what is the cause of all these persons at the ministry? Every morning I ask myself that when I walk into that building, what is the demand? We have to try to understand what the demand is. And this activity has really opened our eyes um, to uh, the demand on the ground and it speaks volumes. To Kroll and I or government to say it's COVID-19, let's shut down the government, let's not provide services to the citizens. But we both know 
we all know that that is not a realistic uh, position to have. We have known about the guidelines and what needs to be put in place um, to keep ourselves safe from COVID-19 for months now. And I believe that if persons follow the regulations, follow the guidelines, that they can keep themselves safe and we can go on uh, with life as normal as possible. We do not know when will this pandemic will be put to an end, when we'll have a vaccine or when we'll have a cure. So we have to start adapting. We will be going to the various regions, as I said earlier, um, to continue similar exercises. Uh, but I do not want us to detract from the intention, the real intention of this activity and this, the successes that are involved. And I think it's necessary. Um, of course, there always, always, we must ensure that we take the COVID-19 into consideration. But we have a duty to provide a service to the people of Guyana. So while that is taking place, at the same time, there are citizens out there who require our services. The Caribbean Examinations Council, CXE, has said that the independent review into region-wide reports of discrepancies with grades at this year's exams has been extended to November 4th. Additionally, CXE has slashed the price for requests for review by 50%. During a media brief on Sunday, Chairman of CXE, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, maintained that the modified approach at this year's exams was educationally and technically thorough. We have taken on board many the recommendations made by the panel and would have made for immediate implementation certain adjustment to what we would have communicated to date. For example, the extension of the deadline for the reporting and making of requests from October 23rd to November 6th for persons to be able to make queries and reviews of examinations of their interest. Secondly, we will reduce the fees associated with the request for a review by 50%. So now the request for a review will be 15 US dollars. And those persons who would have already paid for their review, the difference will be refunded. It is also important to note that the review process will include a remark of the of the, the review script notwithstanding the fundamentals at the cxc are sound but that the relationships within the system must now be made more efficient in this regard, within the 23 recommendation made, plus other recommendations derived from the meeting of the Council following its discussion uh, of the report, that there is now a very urgent need, an immediate need, to address all of the specific concerns raised by stakeholders, students, schools, principals, teachers, parents, and to address all of these within the regulatory structure of CXC that are provided for such discussions to address them with immediate urgency. More news after the break. Stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. Minister within the Ministry of Public Works, Deodat Indar, over the weekend announced that the road from Parika Main Junction to the first Coca will be fixed shortly. On a visit to the area, he also announced that other roads will be fixed, particularly those running to the little-known area called Washington Seam, just before the Parika Bagdan Primary School. The land, which is privately owned, was made available to the residents in 2005. They were given permission to take up residency and will eventually own the piece of land they occupy through a legal procedure. The residents, however, have no access to electricity, but Minister Indar undertook to have this problem fixed within two months. I was here a couple of weeks ago, by it was three, four weeks ago. Three weeks ago, I saw some of the road. 
There is one of them that is going to, um, to, to um, Bushy Park side. The road there is a little bad. We're fixing that road. From Perica coming in, from Perica Junction coming into to the Forest Coca down here, we're fixing that road too. But as the road finish, as they start doing the road and fix the road, as it finish, you have, this is half of October already, you only have November, December, the, road, the year done. So as the road finish, you'll see that the work continue to, to, to carry on. Because no sense you mobilize and demobilize machinery. You will have to do the side roads. I understand that you need a road here as well too. And that road there, no, I'm, let me tell you all. You see these guys here? They're very smart politicians. I tell you right away, that road is going to be done. And the other one you all want is going to be done. Right? But well, let me tell you. Right? So as soon as that one on the front there is finished, I will, I will make sure from the road maintenance budget we can do this road. It is a small road here. We can do this one quickly. This one will be in the budget by the next three, four months. We'll put this one in the budget for 20 Understand they have 150 houses here that don't have electricity, right? Um, and I'm sure every house has, once you don't have electricity, you make plenty of children. So you know how it goes. <laughs> so what will happen? I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back with um, the chairman of the NDC during the week. I'm gonna hook him up with the, 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 the senior team from GPL to come and do a scoping of what is needed here. And they will have. Well, I see you already very close to a network. So I can see the network running along there, it's very close to them. So that is, that is an easy thing to do. I can tell you, you're going to get your electricity within the next two months as well. The Minister of Housing and Water, Colin Kroll, on Sunday visited the Pakaraima Mountain villages of Kato and Tusaneng to distribute the COVID-19 cash grants and to update the communities about government's plans for them. At Cato, Minister Colin Kroll began by urging villagers to adhere to the COVID-19 guidelines to protect themselves and others. We wear our masks, we practice the social distancing, and that we practice safe hygiene methods. That is what we have to do. Once we do those three, then we are on the way to fighting the, against the COVID-19. The message was important because some of the indigenous peoples in the mountains have chosen their own way of protecting themselves, sticking to traditional knowledge and practices. There are some people who keep saying COVID is not real, we got we think we're boiling and drinking and all of that. And um, it helps. I'm of American descent also and I know about bush medicine. This is a little more serious than that and we need to adhere to some of the practices that are advised by the health personnel. Just as villagers hard-pressed because of COVID-19, the government began distribution of cash grants of $25,000 to every household in communities such as Cato. We told you that we also are cognizant of your sufferings. It is for that reason when His Excellency, in his very first speech, uh, the inaugural speech, he committed that there will be allocations for the fight against COVID. And that already, you see the relief for many of the communities. You have currently, being in this sub-region, you have, which is over being overseen by the RU, you have the distribution of those cash grants for households here across the North Pakaraima. So it is intended for every single household, mind you, not families, but in the forest start, every principal householder that you will be benefiting from that $25,000 cash grant. That, my friends, signals a caring government and a government who understands that we need to bring some vibrancy back to your communities and villages. To further support the communities, Minister Krill pointed out that the Community Support Officers Program will be restarted, employing some of their villagers who cannot find work. We committed to you that we are going to return the CSO program when we get into office. And on the very, within the budget, one month after the budget, here you are meeting as a community to engage persons who will possibly become CSOs. That councillors and to show shows our commitment to the people of Guyana, to the people of Quito and to all Italian communities.
that what we've committed to you within the hinterland, we intend to keep. The minister in for villagers too have plans to ensure they have ready access to potable water. But we have a duty as a government and as a people to ensure that you have access wherever you re reside. That is why we are fast-tracking the hinterland program. And it's in, the investment is heavy, but we must get it done. And with the use of rigs and other far means, we will fast-track the hinterland program so that we can have water across our entire south region. Minister Kroll implored village leaders to work with the regional administration in ensuring that development programs are carried out. The Pakarama Mountain village of Cheung Mountain Region 8 will soon have access to potable water. A contract worth $19.3 million has been signed for the construction of a well in the village. On Sunday, Minister within the Ministry of Housing and Water, Suzanne Rodriguez, travelled to the region to give them the news that water will be in their homes by Christmas. When I made the commitment in February of this year to ensure that I make representation on your behalf so that you can have a well in this community because I heard about the challenge with the water system that has been broken for more than two years or maybe longer. I thought I have to address it. And when I made that commitment, I had no idea that I would be made a minister and I had no idea that I would be made a minister of water. So, as fate would have it, that would be my portfolio. I now have responsibility for housing and water. So, that allows me to deliver on our commitment even faster, bringing relief to this community. Now, today, it gives me great pride to come to you and to introduce to you the contractors from Arkisun, Arkisun Contracting Services, who are here. This is Mr. Kisun and his associate, and they will be the they're the ones awarded contract to drill the well. And as Jai said, the, the well will now be in the community. I know I heard that the well was the, the previous well was outside of the community, and you had to walk a, a long distance to get the water. So we want to make sure we bring it in your community. We will drill the well in the community and we will have the distribution network installed. The contractors will bring all of the materials into the community. He will drill the well and then GWI staff will engage the community and have your participation in making the connections uh, to the homes. So we will create some employment to do that. When the newsroom returns, an animal rights group aims to reduce the number of stray animals, particularly cats and dogs. You're watching the newsroom. The animal welfare group, Pause for a Cause, on Sunday held a spay and neuter campaign. One of the objectives of the initiative is to reduce the number of stray animals, particularly cats and dogs. The group is trying to change the way animals are treated in Guyana. The activity was held at the clinic of veterinarian Dr. Nardio Basudel and was sponsored by the Rotary Club of Georgetown. Every day we see cats and dogs being thrown out onto the street because of a lot of unwanted litter. So this is why this is really important. First of all, we have a patient that is sedated and is anesthetized. This is a female cat that we're now monitoring her heartbeat and the oxygen con concentration there with our, with our monitors and we're going to soon uh, go proceed to um, to do our in incision. This animal has been dripped and everything here is sterile including the gloves that the sur surgeon is wearing. What, what, what we want to have is an animal that when we finish the surgery we don't have much of a com complication during or after surgery.
We all see on the road many puppies and kittens just a few weeks old and their fate, you know that, is, is unavoidable. Um, they are part of the traffic fatalities that you see on the road that we just pass by often without caring. But with this initiative, Pause for a Cause is preventing unwanted litter that comes on the road. I've been just quickly look up, I looked up what the effects are. If you spay and neuter a male and a female cat, in four years, you prevent 2,000 unwanted litter. So just multiply that with the amount of cats that you see here and how many unwanted litter is being prevented and animal suffering. So we're glad and we're proud and we commend Paws for a Cause and all the volunteers and the doctor for the good work that they're doing. Our voiceless friends are now being taken care of as the way they should. We have a long way to go, but bit by bit, drop by drop, we aspire one day to be a humane nation as many of our developed countries and our developed partners are. This, we want this energy, we want this vibes, we want this kind of work, this kind of momentum, not only to be as where we are, but for it to get better. We wanted to see bigger campaigns. We wanted to see one day that we have our roads free of strays. We want to have one day where our motorists can actually drive on the road, not wandering or not having to worry about they're going to hit a cow or hit a horse or their families are going to be in danger. We want to see one day that our, our, our leaders, especially in, in the Department of Politics to also come on board with us. We need them. I am making this appeal personally to them that they need to come on board and they need to get their act together so that we can move animal welfare forward. We can be a forward-thinking nation as we always have been. But when it comes to animal welfare, the same cannot be said. Animal welfare has been put on the back burner of this country for too long. It is time now that everyone put their shoulders to the wheel and we must roll. A three-week virtual training course targeting doctors and nurses opened on Monday and aims to better equip and inform health workers on the mental health response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic caused a disruption to the already limited and stretched service given to mental health. Among the vulnerable groups that are greatly affected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic are persons with pre-existing mental health conditions, while studies have shown children, women and older persons are also at risk for developing mental health issues during lockdown. The virtual mental health training began on Monday, October 19th and will conclude on Wednesday, November 4th. Areas of focus will be self-care for healthcare workers, anxiety and depression, dealing with stressful situations, self-harm and suicide, COVID-19 and alcohol and other substances of abuse, domestic violence and mental well-being, psychological first aid, coping skills, counseling skills and techniques. The training will be done in two sessions, one in the morning and the afternoon, so healthcare workers can choose what time best works for them with limited disruption to the medical service. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony said mental health is important to good health and well-being in society and as such the training is important because not a lot of attention is given to mental health care in Guyana. There are also limited mental health professionals in the country. As a result, we do not have enough qualified uh, personnel uh, to adequately diagnose uh, people with mental health vulnerabilities. 
And that is why programs like these are important because our intention is to extend our reach by training our healthcare workers, especially those who are at the primary level. The training will be facilitated by representatives in the mental health field from PAHO WHO and local specialists in Guyana. Minister Anthony further stated that healthcare workers should also be protected and recall the discrimination they faced in the beginning of the pandemic. And we recall that uh, when this all started, that many of our nurses would stand outside of Georgetown Public Hospital waiting for transport, but the minibus operators would refuse to pick them up. We have since had to um, put in place uh, transportation from the hospital to take nursing staff home. And this is because of the stigmatization that followed the disease. We, of course, have our well, uh, healthcare workers have stressful workloads and the psychological repercussions that goes with all of that. This course as you have heard from the outline by Dr. Thomas, uh, is one where we are trying to reach out to our healthcare workers, especially those in primary care, uh, to get them to understand how to better cope with stress, how to detect people with mental health vulnerabilities, and how to counsel and assist them through many of these challenges. Additionally, the issue of an infodemic or the rise in fake news and misinformation on social media are further disrupting the public health efforts to curb the spread of the disease. This, the minister explained, also contributes to anxiety and a rise in stress levels. The ministry will now focus on helping patients before diagnosis, during treatment and after they would have recovered as it relates to their mental state. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isana Lapato. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Welcome back. You're watching the newsroom and it's time for sport. We begin with some news in sport development. The sport minister, Charles Ramson, at the weekend promoted the government's broad-based approach to sport development during a visit to the community of Agricola, Greater Georgetown. The visit, which coincided with the distribution of sport gear and face masks to sport organizers and residents, followed previous interactions by the minister in Tiger Bay, Georgetown, and several villages in Burbese. Avinash Ramzan reports. Addressing media operatives at the conclusion of Saturday's activity, Ramson Jr., who also has ministerial responsibility for youth and culture, said similar visits are carded for hinterland communities in the coming weeks. The minister was accompanied by high-ranking officials of the Ghana Police Force, namely Regional Commander and Assistant Commissioner Simon McBean and Assistant Commissioner Operations Clifton Hicken. Uh, this is the President's initiative where he wants um, the government to remain engaged with people and that we w have to remain connected. Uh, and you would find that this activity is really a representation of what is happening all across the country and even today you would have ministers and um, government activities ro rolling out throughout the country. The minister touched on the administration's approach of being for all people regardless of their political persuasion. Addressing the perception that visits to certain areas might be viewed as a political ploy, Ramson Jr. said. We're not in an election, right? We're not campaigning at the moment. So we're doing this as part of our program, right? Our government program. If you had said to me that we were going to do, we were doing this just before an election, then I would totally understand where the question would coming from, or, or if there was a basis for that question at all. We are not an election. In fact, the election has just concluded, and one of the first things you see us doing here is coming into all areas in in, in the country. Um, the, when it when it when it comes for when it comes to ploys. Tell that to the kids who are going to use these sports gears. They don't consider ploys. They, go, they don't consider political opportunities and things like that. They're going to be using these gears to advance their skills, to advance their health and their well-being, uh, maybe even have a career out of it. Assistant Commissioners Mark Bean and Hicken lauded the initiative by the ministry to reach out to the communities and forming a partnership with law enforcement. Having been able to guide the youthful population through this which is their most um, at-risk stage of their life um, you can guide them out of delinquency because that's that's 
that's an uh, integral part of this community police relationship because we get the youths together and we steer them through a part where we think um, uh, away from delinquent. Now we are just the coordinators, so the police we are just the coordinator. We have the government involved who are the resource uh, providers, the private sector, community leaders and we all come together and they all come together and bring whatever skill set or they have to bring the youths up in the way uh, they, they, they should be brought up. Um, it is important for the police to start building back bridges with the public as part of our strategic plan. Our mandate is to develop partnership. Partnership is so important. Having um, visited these communities, we did an assessment exactly of what is needed to develop the youth. So, you know, we were focused on vocational training, training skill. We've recommended that in doing so, we are going to partner with other stakeholders that can identify uh, which area they like to sponsor so that as a collective, uh, not just only looking to government, but government and other stakeholders. So having visited the community, we worked with some stakeholders, including the Minister of Sports this morning, and um, at least we've commenced the process in terms of developing the community. It's very, very important too for the community to understand that we are part of the whole process and not seeing police as the enemy or police as the friend. So we will continue to extend these olive branches to not just Agricola, but all the communities through the entire 10 administrative regions. The donation of gear aside, the community ground in Agricola would be considered for attention under the ground enhancement program, the minister also highlighted. Minister Ramson Jr. was accompanied by representatives of the Guyana Football Federation, the Georgetown Basketball Association and community leaders from Agricola and other parts of Georgetown. Reporting for Newsroom, I'm Avinash Ramzan. And now Avinash Ramzan joins us for the rest of Sport News. I'm Neil Mark Sticker. Boxing News Now, Guyana has accepted the offer to host the next Caribbean Boxing Championship, which will be held once participating territories are given the all-clear as it relates to COVID-19. According to President of the Guyana Boxing Association and Vice President of the America's Boxing Confederation, Steve Ninval, they will be monitoring closely developments on the global pandemic before making announcement on a definitive time frame. There is no definitive time frame as it relates to hosting of the tournament. We have accepted because of the, we know of the fact of what it does to our boxing, our boxers and our officials. Um, we have the experience in, in um, organizing such tournaments. So that is another reason. Um, COVID will tell exactly when we host that tournament and we will have to follow the guidelines set out by the Ministry of Health and by extension the government of Guyana. Why I say it's not definitive because um, all of the borders are not open right now. Guyana's borders are open, but in other Caribbean countries, um, some borders are closed. So we have to wait until there's a level playing field right through the Caribbean before we can move ahead. Um, if you ask me, my guess, and it is a guess, is that it can be held in the latter quarter of 2021. However, we will have to see how that goes. IPL News now, Rajasthan Royals move up to fifth, while Chennai Super Kings remain bottom of the table in the IPL after match 37 in Abu Dhabi on Monday. Chasing 126, Rajasthan were in early trouble at 28 for three in the power play, losing Ben Stokes for 19, Robin Utapa for four, and the inform Sanju Samson without scoring. However, seasoned internationals Josh Butler and Steve Smith anchored the chase with an unbroken partnership of 98 as Rajasthan won by 7 wickets in 17.3 overs. Butler led the way with a fine 70 not out of 40 balls while Smith played the anchor role with 26 not out of 34. Deepak Chahar picked up 2 for 18 for Chennai Super Kings. Earlier, only Ravindra Jadeja with 35 not out, MS Dhoni with 28 and Sam Curran with 22 got going for Chennai in their 125 for 5. They were stifled by the spin pair Shriyas Gopal and Rahul Tewatia who picked up 2 for 32 from their combined 8 overs without conceding a boundary. Tomorrow, it's Kings 11 Punjab against points leaders Delhi Capitals at 10 hours in Dubai. And that's the end of the news for tonight. I'm Avinash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.